Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the AFR EMS Case Studies. This is uh, Chris Ortiz. I'm the EMS Division Chief for Albuquerque Fire Rescue and joined, as always, by our Medical Director, Dr. Pruitt. Hi, Chief. Welcome, Doc. And Lieutenant A.J. Breen. Hey, Chief. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. So, A.J., one of our uh, instructors here at the Academy for EMS, um, but has spent an extensive time in the field um, as one of our most senior lieutenants and the case we're going to talk about today was pretty interesting when you were on Rescue 16. Yeah. Um, sounds like this call came in initially as a 28 Charlie for a 30-year-old male. Mm -hmm. um, and as we always ask everybody in here, obviously, 30 years old, stroke-like symptoms, that's typically young. But talk to us about some of the things that are running through your head when you're going to a call like that. First and foremost, though, my mind is running. Is it, a, is it an actual stroke? Is it potentially a drug overdose? Um, and maybe a, like a severe alcohol intoxication? Um, you know, Mark and I were talking about like, w what could it possibly be like, you know, on the way to the call, um, with stroke in there, but not at the forefront of my thought process. Sure. Yeah. Not a standard <clears throat> hesitation for a 30 year old. Right. In our mind, but right. Possibly not the case. Yeah. Good deal. That's always good. Just kind of thinking that thing through. Um, so you get there, mm -hmm. sounds like uh, roughly 185 pound adult male. Yeah. Shortness of breath really anxious, uh, that feeling of like impending doom and death and a little bit altered. Yes. What else did you guys get on that initial assessment of the patient? Uh, he, he didn't. Definitely, as soon as you walked in, you knew it wasn't a stroke. Uh, his presentation, not just with it, uh, with how he presented, like as far as altered mental status, but uh, his presentation with his skin color, his skin tone, what he was showing us um, as far as, like he had from his elbows down, he was uh, paler, like absolutely just a completely different color from his elbows down. Um, we couldn't get a sap. He was in and out of consciousness. So w when we walked in, he was very panicked, diaphoretic, tachypneic. And then he just fell back on the bed unconscious. And then he would like shoot up, really confused, combative. And it was this back and forth trying to figure out what was going on with him. And um, the only other person on scene was his girlfriend. Uh, so we tried to ask her what was going on, and you could tell there was definitely some withholding of information from either the 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 patient or the calling party. We couldn't really figure out who. Um, she had said that he had just gotten released uh, from from jail. Uh, he had been out for less than sixteen hours. He was a known drug addict, but didn't use drugs anymore. As this is what the girlfriend told us, um, and so we were we were trying. We were trying to assess him, but we, we just had such a difficult time assessing him. Um, and it was just Mark and I. It's a 28 Charlie, so it's a rescue only call. Uh, we didn't have we didn't have extra hands to leave, and so the, one of the first things I did was figure out how far away five five was because I needed the help to get him out because he was there was no way he was getting out of that place on his own accord. So, so obviously a difficult historian from both yes. him yeah. and the girlfriend. Um, did your uh, physical assessment, vital signs, paint any picture of what could be going on? And it was just kind of all over the place. It was all over the place. We couldn't get a blood pressure, but we couldn't get him to sit still. So even with a manual, I, I usually give up on our machines if I can't get a decent blood pressure within two attempts. And I go, let's just get a manual. This doesn't make sense. Mark's trying to get a manual, and he's just flailing all over the place. We're trying to put oxygen on him. He's ripping the oxygen off. I mean, you could definitely tell he was having some sort of hypoxic emergency just based on his skin presentation uh, but he would not take our oxygen um and so shortly after we attempted to get a, a, a blood pressure there we were able to uh, five five was showed up a showed up and we were able to load him up in and get him in the back of the rig and just start heading to the hospital so i think at this time we've been on scene for a few minutes i think our initial sat was in the 50s uh, his, he was super tachypneic, like in the one thirties, um, we could not get lung sounds cause he wouldn't sit still for lung sounds. Uh, and so it was like, we need to just go. Something is obviously wrong, but he, trying to figure it out here isn't helpful that we should leave. Right. Yeah. Um, that ongoing assessment, did you guys get him on the monitor? We did. Eventually we were up. able to get him on the monitor in the back of the rig and he was signs tack. Like he was just bumping away. I think the highest we recorded him was like in the 140s or 150s. And still maintaining mentation or he started to... Just like, just the mentation was just so odd. He he would maintain periods uh, of normal mentation and then would just stop talking to us and then go unconscious and then come back. 
Interesting. Yeah. Difficult case. Yeah. Of outside of vital signs, kind of keeping him, you know, awake, talking to him, trying to get as much information as you can. Were you able to get anything done really on that transport to the hospital or did his presentation change while you guys were in route? Presentation changed about halfway through. So we could not get a line. Vasculature was flat. He had absolutely nothing. And we were not able to get um, a solid diastolic blood pressure. Uh, we kept getting really funky systolic blood pressures and they were all over the place. So I was like, well, we need a line. For sure. But we looked and we couldn't find anything. So we decided to, to drill him. Okay. And <clears throat> that was the, only the second person in my career that I've IO'd that's technically still awake. So we drilled him and we went to push the Lido. And man, he shot right out of his altered state and just screaming, begging for us to stop. And I'm like, I have, you know, we have to get this line. We were, we were moving down the levofed idea, but we hadn't quite landed on the levofed idea yet because we just didn't have this great picture. We just knew he was tachycardic, tachypnic, and hypotensive, but we didn't know why. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So shortly after we get the IO and secure it, um, we were trying to give him oxygen. I couldn't give this guy CPAP. I wanted to give him CPAP so bad, but the fact that he was in and out of consciousness, we just couldn't do it. There were so many things I wish we could have done that I couldn't do because he just wouldn't maintain any kind of coherence for me. So uh, once we drill the IO, about 30 seconds later, he starts coughing and then just large amounts of pink frothy sputum cough up. And that's when we were like, oh no, he's having flash, he's having flash pulmonary edema. Wow. Yeah. And so we were backing into UNM when he's just hacking up massive amounts of this pink frothy sputum. Unreal. Yeah. Okay. How did you guys address that at all? I mean, you guys were already in the ED parking lot. So yeah, we, we were able to like clear his airway as best we could. He was talking to us. What was interesting is the radio report I gave the hospital was like in and out of consciousness. He would bounce around from like a GCS of six or eight all the way up to a GCS of 13. And we walk in after he coughs up this massive amount of pink, pink frothy sputum, fully talking to the docs. And so the docs are looking at me, we're giving like turnover, and I'm like, trust me, he just coughed up a bunch of pink frothy sputum, we can't get a systolic blood pressure that makes sense, there's no diastolic blood pressure, he's tachycardic, he had admitted on the way in that he had smoked a massive amount of meth, okay. finally, he wanted to be away from his girlfriend, sure. he didn't want his girlfriend to know he had smoked a massive amount of meth, so, um, and so, I think my saving grace with the docs is like a couple minutes after we got him into the ED, he tanked right in front of him. Uh, and I think they ended up having to intubate him. When I did a patient follow-up and they ended up doing a ton of stuff to him. Um, but yeah, he, he luckily he didn't fully crash on me until we had him in the ED. Yeah. Unbelievable call. All right, doc. A lot to unpack there. But um, so we talked about the the methamphetamine use, which he he finally disclosed away from family, which makes sense. That happens a lot to us. Um, and we see the the pink frothy sputum with that meth use. What are we thinking or what are you thinking as a doc when you get that patient? Yeah. Um, so there is a lot going on here. I would, if it was AJ that brought it in, I that provider story, I always try to catch the providers when they bring somebody into the hospital to hear what it was like, what happened in route, what did you see? What do I need to know? Because that piece of the history is so important. And I think a couple critical decisions that you made early on, what we do, what we're, our eyes are kind of trained for is sick versus not sick, right? And the minute you walked in that house, you were thinking sick. Real sick, right? yeah. And making that decision to move, we may not know why you're sick. I may not know what's going on, but I know this is not going to get better it's probably going to get worse. We need to go. And then making, that's probably one of the most important decisions we make, especially if there's nothing I can do right now to make it better. This isn't, our interventions on scene aren't working. We just need to move. Um, I think is is so critical to emphasize here that, that wisdom and discernment and recognizing that early. And then, I don't know, I was curious if it ever crossed your mind because you knew he needed airway management, right? You knew he probably needed blood pressure support. Did you consider sedation? We, so uh, the individual I ran with on 5-5, uh, Clark, he was also my paramedic student, uh -huh. and he's a phenomenal medic. 
So I was really, I was really glad when he showed up. Um, we had talked about sedation, but we never ever confirmed with each other to do it. And I think my concern was that he was just so unstable. Tenuous, yeah. I was the hesitant one about pushing sedation on him. I think that may be one of those situations where you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, because <laughs> yeah. you you need him to be cooperative or at least unresponsive enough to yes. be able to give your care. Right. But then you know that he's hanging on with everything he has right. to maintain that blood pressure, and if you sedate him, it may go away. Yeah. So I don't think you were wrong not to. I was I was timid. I didn't want to take his fight away. Yeah, so. I think, and and that is another sign of wisdom. I think a lot of times um, we talk about that is you need to recognize when people, if he's already shunting to his core, yeah. you can't get a peripheral oxygenation, you don't have a reliable blood pressure. That is a patient who's an extremis, and they are living. The only thing keeping them alive is their adrenaline at that point. Yeah. And I think that became clear. So it was a wise decision, I think, on your part not to, to to keep that sympathetic drive going and just get him to the hospital. Because when he did get to the hospital and um, he did acutely change, he got hypoxic, still had pink frothy sputum. They had to intubate. But as soon as they paralyzed to intubate, his blood pressure dropped substantially to the point that they had to start a lot of pressers on him to to support his blood pressure, which would have happened to you en route, and you may have not had time or the manpower to, to manage all of that as, as quickly as the hospital does. Yeah. Um, so I think it was wise not to. Right. Yeah, great call. But, yeah. So the, uh, we mentioned the intubation. We started the BP support at the ED. They got him up to the cath lab is what I understand. Mm -hmm. And how did that look? So at this point, he's looking for all intents and purposes like cardiogenic shock. So he's, he's super hypoxic, he's shunting. Um, no signs of infection, all happened pretty acutely. And so with the history of the meth use, meth is a very dangerous drug. Um, long-term use can lead to long-term cardiac problems. Smoking it can lead to pulmonary problems. And he had all of that going on. Some acute issues with the meth use, some chronic issues with the meth use, all looking like cardiogenic essentially heart failure. So they needed to take him to the cath lab, make sure it wasn't a, a STEMI or anything they could place a stent in and kind of get a look at his heart function, which was pretty dismal um, down in the 20s. A normal EF is in the 60s. EF is the ejection fraction. How much blood can your heart squeeze out with every squeeze? And, and uh, EF of 20 is just kind of a very floppy, weak heart. Um, and that's what that's what he had, which was leading to fluid backing up in his lungs and um, all, all shock. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about uh, the injury to, to the lung parenchyma that's mm -hmm. secondary to probably smoking that methamphetamine. And we look at um, the clinical scenarios and how the presentation would be the shortness of breath, the hypoxia, pulmonary edema, respiratory distress, basically everything that AJ and his team saw um, but just didn't have that piece of knowing, yes, yeah, specifically was secondary to the methamphetamine use until they were already at the hospital. So he was on the, line, the right line of thought. Absolutely the right train of thought. And I think, you know, there's, a, there's no FDA to regulate the uh, materials in meth, right? So there could be wall plaster, baby formula, whatever, and you're inhaling that directly into your lungs. Um and it could cause a pneumonitis or inflammation in the lungs over a couple of hours. Not that different than, you know, a person you may pull out of a pool that's uh, inhaled chlorine. Uh, it's, it's a toxic chemical in the lungs that can cause a lot of edema, hypoxia, things like that. And so generally the treatment in an ideal situation would be positive pressure to help displace some of that fluid and help the oxygenation. Uh, but it can be a pretty profound pneumonitis. Which again, along the lines of you trained to thought with CPAP, like I wanted to give CPAP, but his mentation wasn't giving me the opportunity to do that. Yeah, so. yeah. Clark and I talked about it, um, and we just were like, we can't, we can't put it on him because he he won't stay awake. Yeah. So he was extremely combative. Um, <clears throat> I'd say it's always twenty twenty. Yeah. Sedation would have been great, but you're like really you're playing that really crazy balancing act. Yeah. Um, and I got to give credit where credit is due. Clark and I had an extensive conversation after that call cleaning the back of his rig up about this meth-induced um, flash pulmonary edema and the cardiomyopathy that it causes. So um, Clark was a great 
partner to ride in and on this for this call. Solid medic, great to bounce ideas off of him. He's fantastic at his job. Awesome. Yeah. Well, kudos to him. Kudos to you and Mark for doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Um, I don't see anything that could have been done differently on this call. I think uh, any takeaways for any new providers? Obviously, now you've seen it. You talked about thinking through things you would have done differently or wanted to do. Um, let's just say perfect world. You had all the information. You knew that somebody had smoked methamphetamine. They presented in the same way. Anything you feel like you would have done differently or we will do differently the next time? Uh, I Maybe maybe be a little more aggressive. I, I The benzos are such a great idea. Just, just a little bit to kind of cool them down. I don't know if the – I mean, at that point, I could have at least tried to bag to displace some of that fluid. Um, but f- for the type of call, I feel like – uh, what he needed was that definitive care at a hospital. And so it, it was kind of like, in my mind, just don't tank in the back of the truck, please. Let's just get you to the hospital. It's <laughs> a sign of wisdom. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, this is going to, if this goes south, we're going to need more hands. We're yeah. Gonna hold off. Um, I, I wish we would have been able to get leave a fed on, right? With how hectic everything was, that at least would have been the one drug I would have liked to have had in for sure was stripping leave a fed when we walked in the hospital. Yeah. So I would have probably been the good if you had had time a good place yeah. to start because then you could at least support his blood pressure knowing that if you're going to sedate him later yeah you've got that support going so yeah if i could change anything i'd i'd eke in that little bit of time to get that leave fed on perfect so. fantastic job great call great case i appreciate you taking the time to come talk to us about it doc thank you as always for your your wisdom and your pearls uh, that's it for today. If anybody has another interesting case they want to bring, let the 7-8 know. Let one of the EMS cadre know. Reach out to us on SharePoint. We can uh, get you down here and record the case. Until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody.